Hi everyone, welcome back to Rich Reviews and first of all hope you had an absolutely fantastic Christmas. So today we're kicking off a new series of videos and we're going to call these our Rich Reviews workshop series. And to start that workshop series off we're going to do a winter workshop series covering off the maintenance items that are going to be performed on our 458 Spider during this winter storage period. So to clarify, I won't be servicing the car, so the all-important main dealer prestigious stamps will go in our service book still with a main dealer. I'm going to be performing what I'm calling incidentary maintenance items, so those are items that wouldn't normally be covered off in a service, additional items that fail, say with error codes that come up on the screen. Now I'm going to be performing those items myself for two reasons. Number one, to save money. The hourly rate at the moment is £165 an hour plus VAT in the UK for a main dealer to service your car or to work on your car. So that works out around £200 an hour guys. So I'm going to be saving you an awful lot of money by bringing this to you for our workshop series. And I'm going to be gaining additional information by learning more about the Ferraris and more about 458s and Ferraris going forward and supercars in, um, going forward. So I'm going to be able to perform that maintenance on these cars myself without having to go to a main dealer. Again, it's all about saving money and bringing you this knowledge in our workshop series. There's two main groups of items that I'm going to be performing the maintenance on. The roof mechanism, including the tunnel cover and the evaporative control system. Now moving on to the first item, maintenance on the roof mechanism. Around the later, latter part of the summer period, we started getting a roof mechanism issue, um, whereby there was an error coming up on the display dashboard where it was saying that the roof wasn't closing properly and in effect it wasn't, wouldn't then lock out. And there's a final lockout stage that happens. So when the roof folds back, and the tunnel cover closes down. This is the tunnel cover, by the way. When this tunnel cover closes down, it then locks in place. You hear the rams pull and then it locks in place. So the tunnel cover is opened and closed by hydraulic rams. These hydraulic rams, there's one near side and there's one off side. These two hydraulic rams pull and push the tunnel cover in effect into position. There's also hydraulic rams that pull and push the roof mechanism down to fold it back and to put it back up. We only have an issue with regards to these, these hydraulic rams that manage the tunnel cover. I did a lot of research and I found out how state is managed on the actual roof mechanism because um, when the roof is in a certain position, the electronics, the ECU for the roof mechanism has to know what state the roof is in with regards to its opening and closing procedure. And it does this using proximity sensors, also known as Hall effect sensors. So these Hall effect sensors, in effect, are sensors that recognize a magnet coming into proximity, into location near the sensor. They have to come in very close proximity. So I researched where all the Hall effect sensors were. And in effect, if you look here, you can see cables coming here to a Hall effect sensor here. There's also Hall effect sensors in the roof mechanism as well, in this top roof mechanism. There's another Hall effect sensor on the offside as well um, that associates with this Hall effect sensor. So it latches, so it qualifies both sides. There's a Hall effect sensor there as well on the rear that doesn't exist on this one to show state when that roof mechanism is down as well. So when the hinges are back. So how did we qualify that it was one of the hydraulic rams that was at fault and not one of the Hall effect sensors? First of all, by using these tie mechanisms. Now you wonder what the hell are these? Well, these are tie clips. It's just a normal tie clip. And this tie clip is fixed or located so it can slide on the actual ram of the hydraulic device here. You wanna make sure that these hydraulic rams are pulling the tunnel cover down because if, if these hydraulic rams are pulling the tunnel cover down properly, far enough, where the proximity sensors could tell the ECU that, okay, the tunnel cover's closer, we can lock it. Um, then it would be the Hall effect sensors that are failing, the proximity sensors that are failing. Um, so it was, it was going to be one of those two areas really that was causing the problem. So first of all, diagnose if it's a hydraulic ram. So you put these tie clips on the ram. When this ram is being closed, this ram is coming in and pushing through the tie clip here. And then when the ram is opening again, you'll get the marker because the tie clip would then stay on that position on the ram. And you'd know where the position of the ram was when it was fully closed to give you an appreciation of whether it fully closed or not. So did that action and this tie clip was indeed further up so i set for okay well we can tell that this ram is failing and this ram isn't pulling the tunnel cover properly closed and in the first instance of course you're saying well surely the ram must be leaking you can see hydraulic fluid around the ram you can't um, yes in some failures you can but in this particular instance there was no failure of the external seals it's the internal seals that are failing so fluid is leaking past the internal seals and that's what's preventing the ram from pulling closed fully 
or from pulling, pulling fully closed. So to qualify that, I took the car to a main dealer and I explained what I expected the fault to be at, that it was this RAM, um, and that could they do put an OBD2 reader on the car and could they then do any checks that they would perform to make sure that it actually is this RAM that's at fault. They put an OBD2 reader on the car and they, they found that these front switches on the front hood weren't closed properly. Now that's to be understood because the whole locking mechanism um, doesn't run through because it senses that the, the tunnel cover isn't closed. So then it doesn't lock off the rest. So you get all other sensor failures, but that's a red herring. It doesn't point to the actual instigated root cause of the problem. So they used a small camera on a stethoscope, which they fed through the side. They then closed the roof or action the roof closing mechanism. And they could see through the small camera fed through here that the proximity sensor wasn't being met, that this RAM wasn't pulling fully closed and that this proximity sensor wasn't being aligned properly with the magnet. Therefore, we could confirm that it was indeed this RAM that was failing and this RAM would need replacing. Thankfully, because it was only a small amount of time at the main dealer, it didn't cost me that much to have that final assessment stage performed. If I'd taken the car to a main dealer without having ascertained a lot of this information myself and focusing their attention to identify directly down onto the Hall Effect sensor or this RAM, then it would have cost me about three times the cost that I paid um, because it had been about three times the hourly rate. And at two, 200 pounds an hour, that's quite a bit, guys. So I'm glad I did all the research myself. And of course, that's knowledge that I attain, not knowledge that the dealer has. So again, better knowledge for me. I know, now know all about these roof mechanisms, how they operate, how the sensors latch state, and where the Hall Effect sensors are, et cetera, et cetera. So that's again, all knowledge that I've gained um, what, during my research and all this area. So that's hydraulic RAM. Now, usually you should replace these hydraulic RAMs as pairs, because usually they fail together, but only this one has actually failed. But I did buy both hydraulic RAMs as a pair. Well, that's because they come as a kit. They're around one and a half thousand pounds and they're the proper OEM hydraulic RAMs. There is a certain company that will maintain these items and will engineer them better than what they were originally. So they'll do OEM plus if you like. Um, but I've bought the original items and I will be, re be replacing just this side first of all. And if I need to, I'll replace the other item as well. And we're gonna be covering that off on a workshop series, a separate workshop video. So you'll see exactly how I replace this hydraulic RAM so that you'll have that information as well on our workshop series on the Rich Reviews channel. The second system that we're gonna be performing maintenance on is the EVAP system or the evaporative control system. An EVAP system, in effect, cutting a very long story short, prevents nasty, fuel vapors from getting out into the environment and this government this is government legislated so this has to be this has to exist in these cars so there's an error code that was thrown up a p2402 error code that was thrown up and in effect it comes up on the dashboard as a, as a major error as the usual scary bloody engine control light failure errors and I, I bought myself an OBD2 reader so I could then analyze what all these error codes are. And using my own OBD2 reader, I diagnosed it as a P2402 error. And that error in effect says that there's a, there's a purge failure or there's a diagnostic pump valve failure. So the diagnostic, the, diagno, the diagnostic pump is part of, as, it, as the name would suggest, part of the diagnostic system for the evaporative control system. But just because the diagnostic pump is showing a failure or, or perceivably a short circuit, doesn't mean it's necessarily a diagnostic pump. It could be the purge valves. And the purge valves are more likely to go than the diagnostic pump. So I'm gonna be replacing the purge valves first of all. And these purge valves, what they actually do is they purge, as the name suggests, um, emissions or unwanted emissions from the actual evaporative system, but they purge them in a proper way. So it's environmentally friendly. Again, this is all government legislated. Now these purge valves make a quite a loud ticking sound as, I, as I've already detailed once they get a certain, to a certain wear point. Um, but you know, they don't have to be that old to get to that stage where they're making quite a bit of sound. And this is known to be an issue. So what Ferrari do is they actually wrap the purge valves, both there's two purge valves, one for each bank. They actually wrap the purge valves in um, an insulating, a sound insulating wrap to prevent that sound from emanating too much, but they're still quite noisy. So, um, you know, that, that you can still hear them when you, when you run these cars. There's two fuel tanks either side, hence two purge valves and two diagnostic valves. But we know that a diagnostic valve is on, on one particular side that's, side that's failing. So we're going to be evaluating that side and that's the left bank. So obviously that's in relation to the cylinder heads, left and right banks. So to be able to gain access to these purge valves, because this is a spider, you have to lift the tunnel cover up and you have to lift this engine cover up. You unbolt this and you lift this engine cover out and then the purge valves are actually located just underneath there. So they're quite easy access once you've got all this engine cover out. Now, while I'm in there, 
um, if it isn't the purge valves, I'm also going to replace the diagnostic pump. So you think, okay, why don't I replace the diagnostic pump first of all? Well, that's because the purge valves are fairly cheap. I think they're around 15, 16 pounds pre-vat. So I'll first of all replace the two purge valves. And then if I'm still getting the error, I'll look at the diagnostic pump and replace the diagnostic pump. What the diagnostic pump is, is part of the diagnostic system to diagnose if there are any leaks in the evaporative control system, because if there are leaks, then that means that emissions are getting out into the environment. Um, and that is again performed as part of the diagnostic ritual that's performed by these cars to assess whether or not there's a problem. And so the diagnostic pump isn't actually part of the evaporative control system that requires that is required for the car to work. It's part of the actual diagnostic system. There you go. And the purge valves aren't essential to the car running, but they are essential with regards to legislation and purging unwanted vapors, fuel vapors to the outside world. So they are required to be replaced. And as I said, they can get noisy, etc., etc., etc. So first of all, I'm going to be lifting this engine cover up. I'm going to be replacing the two purge valves, which are situated just underneath this section. And then if those purge valves don't resolve the error code that I'm getting the P2402 error code, then what I'll be doing is I'm replacing the diagnostic pump and that should resolve that problem. And this is quite a bit of labor as, a, as you probably can imagine, unbolting all this, taking this out, gaining access to the purge valves, replacing the purge valves and possibly replacing the diagnostic pump again, um, and then doing tests and all that, you know, that's gonna to equate to quite a few hours, as you can imagine. So I'm gonna be saving myself quite a bit of money. And when you look at those purge valves costing about 15 pounds each, you doesn't take much to whack that up to a grand or two grand by taking into account the labor charges that would be incurred by taking all this off and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can imagine for the sake of me replacing both those purge valves for the sake of around 40 to 50 pounds, including VAT. So I'm saving myself quite a bit of money by doing all this maintenance work myself and saving myself all that labor charge. Now, while we're in there, we're also gonna be looking at replacing the spark plugs because while we've got this engine cover off, that gives us access to, access to both banks where I can then look at replacing spark plugs. And so that's something I'll, I'll look at doing. I've already got replacement spark plugs for this, so I might as well do that while I'm in there, but it depends how we go and how, how things run, etc. cetera. But um, probably I'll, I will cover off replacing the spark plugs as as well and again we'll bring this to you in our workshop series so you'll get all this information so that you'll be able to do this work yourself section by section in the videos in each of the videos that we provide you so make sure you subscribe guys because this is important this is going to save you an awful lot of money if you can do this work yourself and this always goes on these 458s obviously you have to replace the spark plugs anyway and that costs a fortune dealers cost charge a fortune for the spark plugs they charge a fortune for replacing them and also with regards to the purge valves and the diagnostic pumps these are things that go on these 458s and downstream cars as well and some earlier cars so it's going to be invaluable maintenance information for you guys so if you're not subscribed please think about subscribing and if you've enjoyed this video please give the video a thumbs up very important for our channel thanks a lot for watching guys and happy new year for kicking over into 2024